Uh, so, um, you were just talking about the Common Decency campaign. Yes. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit about that? Just, uh... I would indeed. You might have to stop me after about half an hour. <laughs> oh, that's fine. It's my only question, so half an hour is great. <laughs> okay, well, that's fine. Yeah, this is why I'm here for Common Decency. I'm wearing the badge, as you will see. Mm -hmm. This is a multicoloured one, which comes in very useful because I'm colour blind <laughs> as regards politics, and that's the intention to get people out there to be colour blind. Um, it's a call for common decency, which sounds like something very kind of um, airy-fairy and, um, and philosophical, doesn't it? But it, it's actually a lot more than that. It's, it's a call to arms, in a sense, because I would love to see people who at this present moment are thinking, why should I bother to vote? I would love to see them all impassioned and get out and vote, mm -hmm. get out and vote on, on May the 7th. So that's what the, the campaign's about, really. I'm, what I'm saying to people is, number one, don't imagine that your, vo that your voice can't be heard. In a sense, it's not an imagination right now because our voice in the present system really counts for very little. But I believe if everyone gets up and votes on May the 7th, we can take the first vital steps towards a situation where people's vote will count. So it's a kind of an iterative situation. I don't, anybody who does maths here will understand what I mean. You know, <laughs> basically, you take a first step, and that first step enables you to make the next step. Yeah. So for instance, we can't achieve electoral decency in the next three weeks before the election, because we're set in, in a first-past-the-post system, which is Caroline will tell you. You should read Caroline Lucas's book. The system we have for electing MPs is manifestly unfair. It's ridiculously unfair. I mean, no decent person would quarrel with that view. And the only people who have stood in the way of us moving towards a, a fairer system of voting are, of course, the, the two major parties. Of and, of course, the, the major party we've just been dealing with is, is, a, is a coalition. And they realise that if they bring in proportional representation, they lose votes. Now, that isn't democracy working. That is selfishness working. And I believe that that's what's happening in the parliamentary system at the moment. I've spent the last five years lobbying for animals, trying to give animals a voice. Yes, with your, the Save Me campaign. With the Save Me campaign. So it's about trying to stop the return of blood sports, which Cameron has been desperately trying to bring back, and stopping the pointless massacre of badgers in a forlorn attempt to try and control a farming disease, bovine TB. Um, so we've been in there kind of soldiering away, lobbying people, meeting people, getting to know what MPs are like and how the process works. And I have to tell you, it's shocking. If you guys could see what actually happens in that palace of Westminster and Port Cullis House, which is under the tunnel, um, you would be shocked too, because democracy really does not work as we would like to think it would. In the last five years, the man in the street has had no say whatsoever in the way this country is run. So in a sense, you get 15 hours on polling day for your democracy, and after that, you better shut up because you're not going to be able to make a difference. No matter how much you march, no matter how many votes you get uh, in, in a debate in the House of Commons, no one will pay any attention. It's like a serial dictatorship. Basically, the government's in there, and they, are, they have the arrogance to assume that they can't do any wrong, and they won't listen. They didn't listen to us. We got a, a debate in, in the House of Commons on the Badger Cull, mm -hmm. and the petition that we ran on the government's own website got 300,000 signatures in the end, which is quite a significant yeah, number, so, yeah. you know. We had the debate. We won the vote at the end of the debate. So you think, ah, oh, democracy works. Yeah. But where it falls down is the government paid no attention whatsoever. In fact, they laughed in our face. They, they treated us like it was a joke. And we discovered at that point that we weren't the only people this had happened to. So all these petitions on the government website saying, oh, you can change things, just sign here, you know. It's a farce. It's window dressing. We, you know, we have no influence. We had no influence on this past government. And I think pretty much the same applied to the one before that. I mean, I wasn't consulted as to whether we went to war in Iraq, but that's a different question. Um, so that's what's led me here. I think the whole system has to change. So it's more of a, a sorry to interrupt, it's more of a, a non-ideological campaign. You're not lobbying for any particular policy or party view. It's more you want democracy to That's right. recover, in a sense. That's right. I want to reclaim our democracy. And, you know, people have been asking me questions as if I'm standing for Parliament. I'm not. You know, I have no obligation to tell you what my policy is on fracking or whatever. I could, if you like. <laughs> but, 
But that's not my job. My job, I, as I see it, if I have a job as an activist, is to try and put a government in there, try and put a parliament in there in which there will be fair discussion and there will not be a whip telling people how to vote contrary to their conscience and contrary to what their, their, the voters would like them to vote who put yeah. them in there. So um, it's become a big passion with me and, it, and it's still about animals. I still want to give animals a voice but now I want to give people a voice as well because I realise that's what's wrong with the system. It's like you bang your head up against a wall for a long time and in, in the end you have to you realise you have to knock the wall down yeah. if you're going to make any difference. So that's what it's about. So in a way, the, the first campaign would save me your experiences with that and realising the democratic process isn't quite what you'd expect. That's, that's what's right. led to this. That's, that's what led us to believe that we have to change the democratic process in this country and make it democratic. It sounds yeah. odd, but you know, it took me a long time to realise this. So common decency is, as I see it, the first step towards making this happen. It's, it's, a, it's a scheme. And basically what I'm doing is saying to everyone, number one, please vote. Yeah. Don't assume that it's not worthwhile. Number two, vote for a person rather than a party. Find out if you have a decent person as a candidate, someone who will actually represent you and have the courage to stand up against party whips and whatever. A person who will have the courage to vote against pressures that might be exerted on them from business, from party, or whatever. These people are hard to find. Yeah. Try and find that out. Feed that information back to us, and we will then, on May the 6th, give out our recommendations as to what the way people should vote. So it's a kind of a pyramid scheme. You know, if, if that's what it would be called in business. Yeah. But to my mind, we have a fantastic opportunity here. We can all ignore it. We can sit back and think, OK, we'll treat Election Day the same as we always did, you know. If we don't change, the system won't change. And the same people will be back in there in the next session and they will be denying us our voice. What we can do on May the 7th is, if you contribute to the scheme that I'm proposing, use the social media. We never had this before. We never had Twitter. We never had Facebook and whatever. It can be used to spread this idea far and wide and to make a difference. Okay, here's a constituency, right? just one constituency. Last time we all voted. This guy obviously won. Yeah. He happens to be a conservative, but it doesn't matter, we're colorblind, okay? These two obviously didn't win. And anyone who wants to vote for these people this time will think, ah, there's no point in voting because this guy's obviously going to get back in. It's a safe seat, so let's just not bother to vote. What I say is, look at these people. These are the people who did not vote last time. And common sense and common arithmetic tell you that if all these people got up and voted for just just say, for example, for this guy, then this guy would boot him out. He's a guy who's sitting there very complacent, thinking he's in a safe seat, he's, con he's following the party line, you know, he's, he's not taking any chances, he's not being an individual, he's not probably representing his constituents because he doesn't need to. As long as he keeps in favour with his party, he's fine. They'll keep funding him, they'll keep getting him back in. You know, we can break the system. This diagram tells me Contrary to some people, to some people it spells despair because this guy is so big. To me it spells hope because these are the people who can make all the difference if they decide. So what we're saying is we would like, on the basis of the feedback we get from everyone, to give you a clue as to who you ought to vote for here to achieve what we're all trying to achieve, which is change and decency. And we will help topple the guys who probably all these people think ought to be toppled. Yeah in the interest of common decency. I'm not even going to tell you who that is. Could I ask then, how do you feel about people like um, Russell Brand, who are saying very similar things to you, that we need change, but they're taking the opposite route and encouraging people not to vote? Well, I have a lot of high regard for Russell Brand. I think he has exposed a huge amount of truth which would have lain underground if it hadn't been for his, his questioning mind. I like what he says. I like his book. I've read his book from cover to cover. I think it's great. Um, if you'll notice in the book, there isn't a huge emphasis on this thing about not voting. Mm. What he says is, you know, the system is unsatisfactory and how can we function in a system like that? So on my list of things to do <laughs> before May the 7th is to meet Russell Brand and try and, I guess, confirm the things we have in common and see if he will believe that what I'm offering is a reason to vote. And if he comes over to our side, I'll consider that a very great um, 
That's a victory for you. Yes, yeah. I, can, I think that would be a, a great coming together, and, and I think common decency could actually triumph. We will triumph if we get all these people to vote and we get a big change in, in the House of Parliament. So there won't... What we'll get, I think, is is a situation where the two-party system has been eroded to the point where it can start functioning as a democracy again, as yeah. opposed to bully, bully, bully. Which would be more representative and much better. It would give us all society. a say, yeah. And then you have a parliament which can decide things dispassionately. They won't be saying, oh, if we vote for this, we might not get in next time. They'll be saying, is this for the common good? For instance, is proportional representation going to be a good thing? Well, for the common good... I would say a no-brainer. Of course it's unfair, this present system. Of course we need uh, proportional representation. But in, in a two-party system, you'll never get it because yeah. it's not in their interest. This is a selfish attitude. In the new parliament, if we follow common decency, I believe it could happen. I also believe we could lower the, the voting age to 16. To me, that's a no-brainer as well. My God, you're telling me that people who study politics at the age of 16 shouldn't be allowed to vote? It's, yeah. it's insane, really, you know. And again, it's interest, it's self-interest. David Cameron doesn't want people of 16 to vote because he thinks that they'd probably vote him out. You know, that's not democracy. That's really self-interest running our country. Yeah, certainly. Can I ask, um, as a musician and someone very much in the public eye, do you, how do you reconcile um, music and politics? Is there a relation between the two of them for mm. you? It's a very interesting question. I never used to think so. I used to think that really musicians should shut up about politics. <laughs> that was my view. You know, musicians get on and they entertain, they challenge perhaps. Like poets, they, they engage in a conversation with their audience. And I used to think you should leave politics to other people. But in a sense, I've had my musical co career, you know, and I, I don't quarrel with that. You know, I'm lucky that I still have a musical career, but that's kind of a bonus. Yeah. I've done that, and as a human being, I feel there is another side to me which needs to own up to its responsibility. You know, I'm a very visible person now, and I'm a person, I'm a person who's had an unusual life experience. You know, I got money, I got fame, I got success or whatever. I don't need to be searching for that stuff anymore. So I can be completely clean in my motives. Nobody can tell me I'm doing this for money or fame or whatever, yeah. you know. I'm doing it because it matters to me and I believe that we live in a corrupt country, a, a country which is corrupt and rotten at the core because we still have such a massive area of privilege. People who inherited money, inherited power, and it's wrong. There's no doubt in my mind it's wrong. And the people starving, who can't feed their families, who are doing a good day's work but not getting paid for it. So to me, that's wrong. You know, and if I sound like a socialist, my God, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, I think it comes with, it comes with a, an awareness. You know, and I was brought up in a, in a good Tory family. Mm. And I always, in the beginning, I would vote like my parents always did, you know, vote for people who, who are encouraging enterprise, you know, people who work hard, get on, and they make money, and that's what we should be voting for. I deeply suspect it now. You know, as soon as I discovered that the trickle-down um, policy is a lie. It doesn't quite trickle down the way it It doesn't came. trickle down, it trickles upwards. Mm -hmm. you know? So as soon as I did, started to see these things and see the way that politicians behave, I mean, we've, let me tell you, I've seen, <laughs> you know, we've been in there quite a lot and you'll, you'll be in there for a debate, you'll be watching a debate, there'll be a, a handful of people in there debating the issue. The bell goes to vote and all these MPs will run in from the bar and from the restaurants or whatever and they go, what are we voting for? What are we, oh, I have to vote on this. They, will, they have no idea even what they're voting for. And that's our democracy at work. Yeah. So, you know... Sorry, and they're going to follow the whips and vote on the party line. Yeah. They're going to do what they're told, otherwise they don't get on. Yeah. As you're saying, um, you've had your music career and you now want to be more involved in the politics. And it seems like mm. your music career was a springboard for you to now have a clean career in politics. Would you encourage other musicians or other celebrities like Russell Brand to use their platform to do this as well? I think it depends more on your you know, what you are as a person. I mean, I don't really see myself as a celebrity. I see myself as someone who's worked hard for what he got, or for which I'm proud. Yeah, but I don't regard myself as a celebrity. You know, I, I don't think I should rely on that as a kind of privilege in, in another kind of privilege. I think, you know, I have the same say as anybody else. And what I'd like to do, seeing as I have a little bit of space around me, is encourage other people to have that privilege. Yeah.